Good evening. <laughs> and um, I'm Dr. Deborah Savage. I'm a professor of philosophy and theology at the St. Paul Seminary School of Divinity. I'll be your host tonight. And we're going to just wait a few minutes while people sign on, and then we'll get started. Welcome. So I mentioned who I was already, so I'll ju I just want to clarify, I'm going to be the moderator at a certain point. We're going to have a Q&A period and I'll handle that for us. But this is a um, uh, an initiative, a, a, an event that's being co-sponsored by the Murphy Institute and the Siena Symposium for Women, Family and Culture. Both of us uh, reside, if you will, at the University of St. Thomas. And um, we're both proud to welcome Uju uh, Okioka to this event. Um, a word about the Siena Symposium, I guess, it started in the year 2000. And as a response to John Paul II's call for an explicitly Christian feminism in Evangelium Vitae 99. And we have been doing this kind of work for, gosh, however many years that is now, is it 21? And so uh, uh, this is sort of a really a great privilege for us to be able to work with the Murphy Institute and sponsor Uju's uh, talk tonight. So I want to just take a minute to um, introduce Uju to you. She has a very impressive biogra uh, biography. Sorry. <laughs> and. Um, I have to admit, it's kind of strange to talk to you and I can't see any of you. So, um, so uh, Obian Uju Ekioka, which whom, whom we can refer to as Uju, merciful, mercifully, is an internationally acclaimed strategist, speaker, author, social activist, and documentary filmmaker. She was born and raised in southeastern Nigeria. She is the founder and president of Culture of Life Africa an organization dedicated to the promotion of an authentic culture of life in Africa and beyond. She is the author of Target Africa, Ideological Neocolonialism Neo of the 21st Century, published by Ignatius Press, and now translated and republished in Spain and Saudi Arabia. She is the executive producer of the award-winning documentary, Strings Attached. Uh, Uju has advised many African, European, and North American legislators and political influencers on issues concerning women's health, youth, families, health care, foreign aid, education, and culture. She has also worked closely with religious leaders across the African continent and has co-authored a number of pro-life declarations with different African Catholic Episcopal, Episcopal conferences. She has planned, organized, and facilitated many major pro-life conferences, strategic seminars, and March for Life rallies in various African countries. Uju has traveled the world extensively, speaking in 65 cities across 24 countries. She has been welcomed as a guest speaker at many high-profile meetings and events, including policy briefings at the White House, the U.S. State Department, and a number of parliaments around the world, including the European Parliament. She also frequently addresses her concerns at various United Nations conferences and events. She has been featured by no numerous broadcast networks, including the BBC and Al Jazeera, where she has defended the sanctity and dignity of every human life. Consistent with her love for the wonder of life, Obianju, uh, Obianuju also currently works as a specialist biomedical scientist in the United Kingdom. Prior to her current position, she was a medical laboratory scientist at the University of Nigeria Teaching Hospital. She holds a master's degree in biomedical science from the University of East London and a bachelor's degree in microbiology from the University of Nigeria. So she has a lot to tell us. And I would just want to say, first of all, she wanted to be here with us in person, but travel restri restrictions prevented that. And so at the same time, she has uh, uh, been very gracious in the way she's handled this situation. And she's pre recorded a presentation for us, which we will now watch. And after that, we'll have our panel.
Greetings, everyone. My name is Obianu Joekocha, and I'm so very grateful to the Murphy Institute for inviting me to participate in this event. So thank you, Murphy Institute. Uh, I will be presenting today on the topic, Fighting for Freedom, Neocolonialism and African Experience. I know the term fighting for freedom is so commonly used, especially in our world today, that sometimes it almost seems emptied of meaning. But I'm hoping that by the end of this presentation, we will see that if there was ever one time when it is really appropriate to use, it is when referring to something like neocolonialism. For the last uh, couple of years, I, a lot of my work has been based off of this topic, neocolonialism, and just observing what goes on between African nations and their Western counterparts or their Western donors. Uh, it's a topic that I find so fascinating, so profound, so disturbing in many regards uh, that when I think about it, the only outcome I want now is just freedom. It's just really freedom. And I think really what needs to happen right now uh, is, is for, for, for us to fight for the freedom of the African people. Um, now, before I delve deeper into this topic, I would like to make a full disclosure <laughs> because I have made this presentation or similar presentation at different places and to different audiences. And what I find is that especially when it's to um, hostile audience is that sometimes people want to throw me off and they say, why do you talk about Africa? You're not supposed to talk about Africa. Africa is not a country. It's, you know, it's not a country. How can one Nigerian woman be speaking about Af the entire Africa? Actually, I do have reason to believe that Africa can be discussed as an entire region or as one, as, as we say in this topic, as we do have one African experience with regards to certain things. But in full disclosure, I am Nigerian by birth and by nationality. And yes, I do understand the complexities that have to do with my continent. I know that it is a massive, massive continent with 55 different countries uh, where there are more than a billion people and there are thousands of languages spoken, there are thousands of ethnic groups uh, within the African continent, there are people who profess different creeds, uh, and there, so there is really not one African culture. But I find from, from research, from data, from traveling, speaking to different people, being in, you know, being in different communities across the African continent, I do see that indeed there are common threads within culture whereby certain things, especially within the value system of those communities, they find it equally important. So something, for example, that is important to somebody in Ghana is equally could be equally important to someone in Uganda. And I find on certain issues particularly, yes, I can really refer to something as an African culture because we find it among, among people in different countries, no matter where you find them, no matter the language they're speaking, no matter the level of well, so in, in those societies, there are certain things that people across the continent of Africa hold dear, hold important, hold as sacred. So yes, yes, in this regard, I can talk about an African experience. Now that's my that's my disclaimer and my full disclosure. So just moving on now to uh, the the core of of this topic, which is neocolonialism. I believe that in order for anybody to fully understand neocolonialism or the new colonialism, um, one has to at least have a basic understanding of the old colonialism or what happened in history. Um, the African continent in the from the 1800s up until, I'd say even up until the 1960s, uh, the African continent was colonized. So that is the original colonialism, if you like, the old colonialism that then came before this thing we are now going to understand today, which is the new colonialism or the neo-colonialism. Uh, the reality of what happened at the time, uh, the colonialism of the 20th century, as I have it here, is that the several Western countries or Western superpowers gathered together and uh, took a map of the of what is what we now understand as the African continent, and they divided it into various sections and various countries. And each of those chunks of the continent of Africa uh, was given 
to an, a superpower, Western superpower. So we had uh, the colonials from Great Britain and, and from France who got like large chunks of our continent. There were also other colonials who were from uh, Portugal and Spain and Belgium. Uh, Italy as well. A lot of people don't don't know that Italy, in fact, did get some countries that they colonized in African continent and Germany uh, that we still rarely hear about simply because by 1914, during the First World War, uh, the Germans were sort of ousted out of Africa. So they had to let go, they had to leave the countries where they were colonizing because they fell out with the superpowers. So in other words, everything that was happening in and around Africa uh, was really most importantly determined by our colonial masters. They were the ones who were leading us, they were determining what will happen in, in each African country or which, whichever country that is annexed to them. Um, and, and so this was how they, they led the African people up until what we'll call the wave of independence in Africa. And that happened uh, starting from the very late 1950s. So by 1960s, uh, the, a lot of, or most of the African countries had gained their independence. That is the reality of Africa as far as colonialism, the old colonialism is concerned. But talking today about the, what, what is, what goes on on the African continent today, the independent Africa, uh, there, there are several current dynamics that one has to understand or consider, even before you consider then the neocolonialism, because the neocolonialism is happening and continues to happen on the background or the backdrop of what is our reality today. That the African continent, one cannot talk about the African continent or the various African countries within the continent without considering all the different moving parts which will include things that have to do with the economy. As people know, a lot of our African countries are struggling from the point of view of economy. Uh, we have issues that have to do with politics and with so, many, so many considerations there and all of that that will affect the people within those countries. Uh, there are issues of security. People who are listening to international news will know that in a country like mine, Nigeria, uh, there have been problems of terrorism. There are other African countries as well where security has really been a real concern, a real problem uh, for the people. There are, consider there are considerations of infrastructure that we people have to make when thinking of Africa. And of course, development, which is a recurring theme every time nations gather, they are talking about how can the African countries become more developed. So development is just a huge consideration. Um, and also healthcare, you know, when we talk about uh, epidemics, even before the one we've seen now, the pandemic we've just currently seen around the world. But but before, whenever anybody talks about epidemic, I think people will, will sort of consider Africa when you think of Ebola, when you think of uh, the cholera, when you think of even the HIV AIDS. One's mind will go to Africa and it, it's really at that point that one would see, uh, see, I think, a lot of the inadequacies within African countries. And so each of these considerations, the economy, the politics of the people, the infrastructure, the security issues and challenges, um, each of them will present a weakness within the various African countries. So it's really on this backdrop of all these vulnerabilities that African countries have and experience that these people come in, these donors, particularly our Western donors, who come to us just looking like they're bearing gifts and freebies that look so good, especially to our African leaders, to the point that they have almost an open door policy to, to the donors that, that approach the various African countries. The donors are coming as nations. They are sometimes organizations, NGOs. Uh, then we also find a lot of private foundations, especially in more recent times, we have these various foundations. Uh, and Africa seems to be the preferred destination all the time for, for anyone who wants to do good. Um, and I know that from, from one point of view, one would say, well, yeah, it's the intentions are very good. They, they want to see an end to suffering in Africa. They want to help the people of Africa. Um, but in some regards, especially in more recent times, this is what I have come to observe. This is what we have, we have seen in, in just the shift 
that is happening within these relationships between donor and recipient that, in fact, there is need to question exactly what is going on. Is it philanthropy or is it new colonialism? Let's find out. So this is what the power imbalance, the reality of the power imbalance between the Western donor and the African recipient. What we find is that the, it, the African countries have reached such a point of high dependence on the donor, the donors have been have been coming to Africa and without any real plan of, of living, it, it's it's almost as if they they have come into African continent and they give money and they give aid. And each year we find even the data shows that the aid being given keeps increasing year on year. There is no real end to it, and there is even no real uh, vision by both the donor and the recipient of how this should come to an end, of how, where are we going, how, how will we see an end to this dependency. So we find this uh, situation where the African countries, a lot of them uh, in many ways are now very much dependent on, on the donor's funding. Uh, the, and so the donor now sits in a very powerful position where they are the ones who are defining exactly what they will be donating to, exactly not just what they'll be donating to, but what projects will then be prioritized uh, in the various African countries. They are the ones making the determinations of the funding. They are the ones who then expect a certain level of compliance by the recipient, the African recipient, uh, and any reluctance or refusal uh, by an African country, it meets with zero tolerance. So we find situations where, say, for example, an African leader says, uh, actually, we don't want funding on this particular thing, uh, especially when it, when it has to do with issues that are that are a bit touchy or a bit difficult subjects. Uh, one particular African president at one point in time had said uh, that we African countries don't want any funding for condoms. This was during the uh, the peak of the HIV uh, pandemic at the time or HIV epidemic. Um, and the backlash that came to that president, that particular African leader, was unbelievable what was unleashed upon him and how these Western donors who were who initially came and said, we came to help. But when this president then said, oh, no, I want my country to choose a path where we are learning more about abstinence and fidelity, oh, my goodness, there was a, a huge campaign against him. Uh, and they got, uh, you know, there was so much pushback that I believe just over time, I think he kind of gave up, gave up on, on that particular interest of his where, where he didn't want his country dependent on condoms, for example. So it, there is no room at all in the minds of our donors. Uh, we've come to see that for any refusal or any challenge or any kind of questioning. Uh, there is also very strong criticism, like in the case of that particular African leader, uh, once you know somebody doesn't want to comply. Uh, and, and so this is what I find has now resulted in the new colonialism. Um, this has become the gateway, if you like, to the 21st century colonialism, which is you know in many ways is different than what happened in the 20th century, but in some ways as well there are similarities of how the Western superpowers, which is now not only countries but also single individuals who have enough wealth to kind of force their way, they have managed to you know surround the African continent, and it is really what they want. Uh, that is now being done. They are pushing through policies. They are pushing through their way of life. They are pushing through their own views and values. And in many ways, they are then forcing back uh, the African people who already have their value system. They have their culture. They have their traditions. They have things that they hold their beliefs that they hold their well, the donor is really the master. So this is the colonialism of the 21st uh, century. So the, what we find now looking, going down to look at data, 
we what I, I have observed and what is really the reality, as you would see in a minute, is that there has been a visible shift. Now, this is a graph that I like to refer to because it illustrates quite perfectly and quite clearly uh, the shift that has happened in the mindset of Africa's donors when it comes to, to age. This is uh, data that has come from the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, an organization that tracks aid, uh, showing exactly what happened with the official development assistance, which is another way of saying humanitarian aid. And if one looks at the graph, you can see what happened uh, with the various things. You can see education, healthcare, uh, water and sanitation, Population programs, though, is the one that fascinates me the most because population programs um, is this red mark. You can see that it, uh, in 1996, when this, from when this data um, started, that it was really the least of what was given or what was allocated. So the list was given to population programs um, and, and there were more uh, humanitarian assistance given to things like healthcare and water and sanitation and uh, even education uh, within Africa. But then the rent starts to rise and around the time when there was the economic recession, especially within Western countries, Everything was kind of coming down 2007, 2008, 2009. The less uh, assistance was being given, less ODA was being given, but population program kept going up. So the money, in other words, that was being put by Africa's Western donors towards Africa uh, had no reversal when it came to population program. It just kept giving us, giving us more and more and more um things that have to do with population programs. So to understand this a bit more, let's just unpack a bit what the population programs entailed or what it included. So aid for population programs would include all aspects of the so-called SRHR, the sexual and reproductive health and rights. And this would be things that have to do with giving contraception, uh, providing condoms, uh, especially when one looks at what happened with HIV. So condoms be became a really huge aspect uh, of humanitarian aid it has to do with the, the so-called um, comprehensive sexuality education for children, uh, whereby children are being exposed to these, um, I, I think, highly inappropriate and highly graphic sort of you know, education on, on human sexuality, and they try to un universalize that and try to globalize it and brought to African schools and um, these kinds of things that even African parents found quite outrageous. And even up to now, we are still in these fights um, because there is so much funding uh, being put behind this. There is now so much push at all levels in various African communities to force this into African schools. And of course, uh, everything that has to do with abortion. So giving aid to um, to, to organizations that, that have to do with the promotion or the providing of abortion, organizations like the International Planned Parenthood Federation, Marie Stokes International, DKT International, these organizations now could gain access to money that could have gone to other forms of humanitarian assistance. So the Western countries who gathered together as Africa's donors then decided that population program is something that deserves more uh, money and more assistance than, ex ex you know, water and sanitation, for example, or education or health care. So from the graph that I showed you, you would see that whereas everything else over the years um, have been reduced in, in the aid that we get in those aspects, in, in many regards, but not for population programs. We keep getting more and more to the point that um, by the end of that data, which was over this 16 year period, by the year 2013, the highest aid that Africa was getting uh, it, on the social, the social um, sector was 
for population programs. So they're giving us more money for com contraception and condoms and abortion and comprehensive sexuality education for our children than they are giving us for real education, for real health care, uh, for uh, water and sanitation for communities that don't have access to basic needs like that and infrastructure. And uh, so this is really a shift, a radical shift, if I can put it that way, in the mindset of African Western donors. And it is what has now set the tone for what we find now uh, we, when it comes to the international community, when it comes to organizations like the United Nations, where countries gather together, it's, you, you know, whenever we hear our Western donors speaking, you can see that they keep pushing these priorities that they come, they come to us with, the population program, which they've shown it, they've shown their what they think about it in the way they are giving money, but they're ready to go beyond just giving money and resources to promote these issues. Uh, they are now even going as far as pushing policy, pushing for changes, pushing for countries with, you know, within Africa to change their laws. So this, you know, this is what we have found. But in reality, when you are looking at the donor's will, what I like to call the reality of the donor's will versus the recipient's way, is that we find, uh, uh, you know, an organization or an initiative like Condomize, which was, you know, promoted by the United Nations Population Fund, UNF whereby they're sharing hundreds of thousands of condoms uh, across different African communities. Uh, for example, this party that they, that they had in 2014 uh, in an African country where they said they shared more than 100,000 condoms in one single party. But the reality of what I find on ground is that you go to African communities and you find young people who are carrying placards and saying, please help us with education. We don't want condoms. You find places where Western donors drop you know, millions and millions of condoms, what millions of dollars, and yet nobody wants them. These are things that we've seen on the ground. Uh, there are places where, for example, contraception programs um, have been put in place by Western donors, and yet at the end of the day, nobody is using those services, nobody is frequenting it. Sometimes they give African women in various places um, contraceptive drugs and devices, and you find that our discontinuation rate remains very high. Women may accept these contraceptives, um, but then after a short while, they discontinue it or they try to, to take it out or remove it for, for the ones that are long-term uh, uh, contraceptive devices. And yet the donors come back, instead of them to understand that within these communities, these are things that people do not consider priority. Uh, but instead of them to do that, they, they still give even more money for the same things, just hoping to achieve a different uh, outcome at the end of the day. So the reality of the donor's will versus the recipient's way. Uh, there was a program uh, that was uh, hosted a couple of years ago by several Western countries. They call it the SAF Project, Safe Abortion Action Fund. So it was uh, put together by the International Planned Parenthood Federation, but uh, the funding really came from Western nations like the United Kingdom, like the Netherlands. You know, there were all these countries that gathered together and put large amount of money into this um, particular program that has to do with the promotion of abortion in African countries. You can see the website they did. They put a nice looking African woman on that website. However, the reality that we find on ground again is you go into communities and you find African women in villages, towns and cities alike saying, we don't want abortion. We don't give us abortion, please. We want health care. We want our children to be able to go to school. We want to be able to have drinking water uh, close by to our home so that we don't drink water that will kill us. Uh, these, are, these are the things that we find on ground and the donors probably know that because there has been so much failure and so much rejection and objections to 
all these things that they are bringing to African countries and you know various communities, and yet each time they come, they give us more. And so you find yourself with a graph that looks like the one we just saw, where whereby less money is being given for education, less money is being given for water and sanitation, uh, and yet more money is being put into what they're calling population programs. Um, that is that is it. The reality of the donors way or the donor's will versus the recipient's way. Now let's look at abortion and what the what I call the landscape of abortion, where all these green parts, uh, places where you have abortion, legalized abortion, or what people call abortion on demand. In Africa, a lot of people don't realize it, but most of the African countries, remember how I spoke about there are various African countries, there's 55 African countries. Uh, out of all those countries in Africa, it is only four countries that actually have what you will consider as abortion on demand. Uh, and this will be South Africa, Tunisia, Cape Verde, and Mozambique. Most of the other African countries uh, have all kinds of restrictions against abortion. So I'd say about 80% of the African countries still remain by policy and by law pro-life, if you like. So people are against abortion or the governments are against abortion. The laws reflect that, the policies reflect that. Uh, and, and then in reality as well, what people think on ground uh, is that the people themselves are largely pro-life because people say, well, you know, even if a country might not have legal abortion, maybe the people in that country would want legal abortion. So if you look at the data, in 2014, uh, Pew Research had a very robust survey where, whereby people were asked various questions in different countries around the world. So I just picked uh, some of the African countries where people were questioned on this particular issue of abortion. And the question was, uh, do you find abortion morally acceptable or morally unacceptable? And it is quite telling to, to, to realize, but not shocking at all to me, but really quite telling uh, that most of the respondents in the African countries, upwards of 80%, and in some countries, even up to 90%, people were saying that they are against abortion. Uh, for South Africa, that has had legal, legalized abortion for the past 20 something years, uh, even more than 60% of the people who were questioned said that they find abortion morally unacceptable. So the African people themselves, uh, are so against abortion and so resistant to the idea of legalized abortion that, in fact, it then is reflected in our reality and our policy. And yet, whenever the donors come, the donors overlook uh, the, the majority, the overwhelming majority of the African public who are against abortion and, and who are against the legalization of abortion. And yet, they put more money into the hands of Western organizations that are abortion providers uh, who are running around the African continent trying to push the issue, trying to lobby the issue for the issue, trying to force uh, public, uh, you know, public opinion on the issue of abortion. And on, it's very unfortunate because whenever I go to an African country, it, you know, one would be so saddened to see that the people themselves, the, the general population themselves, are saying, we don't want all these things that, that these Western donors are, are trying to give us, we don't want it. So you, I find situations where women are coming out with placards for, you know, we, we host an event and women are coming out with placards, people are, are writing things at home and, and making these, these placards at home and saying, we don't want abortion, we know that abortion hurts women, we want to protect our unborn children, these children are important to us, these are uh, you know, within our culture, we cannot kill, we don't want to kill our children. So there are all these things I've heard um, women talk about and, and, and families talk about and even men talk about 
But then you turn around and you find a Western country uh, that completely ignores them, a Western country that completely just looks the other way and that, that just goes straight to an abortion organization and gives them money and says, go in and, and do some work in Africa. You find an organization like Center for Reproductive Rights. I mean, obviously, there's so many examples that I can share with you of what we've seen over the years and some of the Western organizations who come directly from their Western, you know, country offices and, and install themselves uh, into African societies, uh, build their, their offices in, in African capitals, and then try to, from that point, affect everything that goes on in that country. So I give you an example of Center for Reproductive Rights, which I know for an American audience, most of you probably would have heard of the Center for Reproductive Rights. It is an American organization. Uh, they, they are very, very active in DC, and I think the headquarters um, is in New York. And in America, you find them that they are, you know, putting a lot of money, that they have tons of funding, uh, uh, you know, pushing all kinds of things at your Supreme Court. They are pushing things uh, within uh, at local levels, at your legislators and, and such. They are there on, you know, social media and they are there even in mainstream media trying to affect and influence things, even though, uh, of course, we know what happens at that level in most Western countries. But in Africa, the situation is different, that uh, the, the public sentiment is that abortion is terrible and people don't want it. So what the Center for Reproductive Rights has done is that um, the, this particular specific example is that they came to Kenya uh, a couple of years ago. This was, I think, back in 2015. They picked a case, uh, went to court with it. They put in so much money and uh, you know, encourage this woman who had an illegal abortion and whose daughter uh, having an illegal abortion got then, I think she had a problem. Uh, so they, they took this girl and used her as, uh, you know, the point of judicial activism. They went to court against the Kenyan health ministry and the Kenyan government, and they went all the way to the high court, the highest court in the land. Uh, mind you, this is an American organization with all their funding and all their money. They're able to push uh, an African country or the health ministry of an African country to the point where they get to the highest court and they win a case where, whereby abortion is still not legal in, in Kenya, but then the court then told the health ministry that they have to have a handbook uh, that is available that, that describes how to perform abortions. And so I find it quite interesting that the Center for Reproductive Rights then goes back on their website and they are celebrating what happened, uh, how they won this uh, legal battle in Kenya. Uh, and they, they call it, they call it a, how they, they won a victory, a major victory for Africa, abortion rights in Africa, even though this happened in the one single African country, this is something that shows you exactly how they are thinking. Um, this is judicial activism. It is the result, I think, of the kind of funding that has come from Western donors who have then put money into the hands of abortion organizations and then sent them into Africa to wreak havoc and to kind of challenge the system that we have there uh, that very much connect to views, people's views, deeply held views and values that have to do with um, the promotion of life. Uh, so this is just one example. But also, even in more recent times, um, I can so many things that I can talk about whereby we find our Western donors are, are sort of seeing themselves as the stakeholders, they are major influencers of, of policy in Africa. And it's only because they come with funding. It's only because of the kind of money they come with. There's, you know, uh, in Africa, if someone comes with millions of dollars, it is something that can, in, in fact, eventually influence policy, if nothing else, even if not public sentiment. But they can push our government. They can go to court against our government. They can, uh, you know, they can push our legislators and lobby them so heavily. That is neocolonialism. That's, that's really a Western force having their way and determining exactly where an African nation will go, even if it's against the will of the people, the very obvious will of the people. So even in more recent times, I'll find what happened with 
um, what has happened with COVID, the COVID pandemic during this period. Uh, we have had uh, the difficulties that people have experienced in, in various countries, including the West. This is something that affected Western countries as well as, as African countries. So uh, it was really towards the beginning of the COVID pandemic that we started hearing about this thing called essential healthcare services. And we were all very shocked uh, to find that uh, people who, uh, uh, you know, the abortion movement, even in the, in the West, one of the first things they did was trying to establish and push for abortion to be seen or considered as a, a, an essential health care. The same thing was extended to Africa for those who didn't follow what was going on, on the, you know, among the African countries and uh, within the international community is that uh, at places like the United Nations, African countries were being pushed towards this idea that abortion is in fact uh, uh, an essential health care. In as much as people within African, the African continent have continued to reject abortion, even though people have continued to say they find it you know, morally unacceptable, they find it reprehensible, they find it against their values and, and their views. But then imagine that we then find ourselves in this difficult position of the pandemic and then the international community is nudging African countries um, to accept the fact that abortion is an important uh, part of health care, uh, given that they failed on so many occasions. So, of course, in this very uh, unprecedented case of the pandemic, the, the abortion movement found it as a, a huge opening. And so we found that even when talking about humanitarian aid, there were so many um, instances and several cases where uh, things like food relief, you know, for food, uh, getting aid to, to countries and communities where people were lacking so much given what happened with the pandemic, places where people are having dire difficulties and, and very uh, severe backlash of the, you know, everything that came with the pandemic, not just the pandemic itself, but the fact that, that businesses were stopped and, and you know, uh, food chains were cut and, and many countries came to a crashing halt in the first couple of months. There were parts of Africa where people didn't even have any food to eat because uh, food chains and food, you know, food supply chains were, were completely uh, cut off. So at that point where the international community was gathering to make sure that Africa had a soft landing or a softer landing and that we don't suffer, you know, as much as we possibly could, uh, given the already difficult situation in, in those different African countries. Uh, we then started hearing um, that abortion was being forced into the matter that in some resolutions, sexual and reproductive health and rights, which would include abortion, was being pushed uh, by several people, especially from the quarters of those who were, uh, you, you could call the Western donors. And um, even in, in on ground, in, in several cases where I uh, spoke to people and did some research, we found that in countries like Kenya, Malawi, and Namibia, even they went as far as trying to introduce uh, you know, in, in by stilt or by, by force, um, bills, sexual and reproductive uh, bills or reproductive health bills or even directly abortion bills uh, onto those uh, uh, parliaments. So in other words, trying to get abortion legalized using the cover of the pandemic, given that with what has happened, uh, and especially the, the very first half of uh, the, the pandemic, there were countries where people were not even thinking of anything. I mean, people were trying to survive, people were losing employment, you know, all kinds of things were happening, all challenges that people were finding within their communities. And so it would have been easy to try to force abortion through while nobody was looking. And that was exactly how it happened in some of the African countries. Um, but fortunately, uh, things, you know, fortunately, there, there was a good response against uh, these attempts, and so, uh, of course, those attempts failed, but it goes to show the mindset within uh, the Western colonial influencers 
the new colonial influencers who now are trying to push Africa towards certain issues, especially because they have the donor power, they have the money, they have uh, the what it takes to influence policy, and so they, they keep pushing us at that point. Um, now, the donor is really the master. If you think about it that way, the donor is the master. We, we, you know, what I, what I, what I find is that with this kind of relationship, where they are able to come in whenever they want, there is like an open door policy. Be it out, you know, during the pandemic, be it during normal times, that our donors are able to walk into a, a, an African government office or a ministry or you know even a parliament, and they are demanding change, they are demanding a shift, given that they have the money. But if you remember, the donors first of all come to us like they are just there to help us. They are there, you know, we have this money and this resource, uh, this resource if you want it. But then they quickly shift from becoming just a donor to the master. There is a lot of paternalism that goes into it where they're thinking like the original uh, colonials that we know what is best for these people. And that's the attitude. I think that's the first attitude in the mind of the uh, the neo-colonial master, if you like. They, they, they come to us with a kind of attitude of cultural imperialism. And so this is the neo-colonialism, the ideological neo-colonialism that we are seeing these days. But I find that there is even something much more sinister in their attitude uh, to us, especially after having observed what happened, um, how they tried to push abortion upon African countries during the pandemic, I think uh, that we've reached that point where Africa's, a lot of Africa's Western donors have come with an attitude of supremacy. No, not white supremacy, but what I call ideological supremacy, where they are really thinking that they, we are superior. And so because we are superior, our position is, uh, is kind of much more on a moral high ground. And the only acceptable outcome and the only acceptable expectation is that our African recipients should do exactly what we want. That is supremacy. That is ideological supremacy. And we find that that is exactly uh, where they, a lot of the African countries find themselves. Uh, there is a really notable Nigerian um, author who uh, you know, wrote a lot of uh, important uh, literature books called, who, his name is Chinua Achebe. He has a quote that I love to go back to all the time, especially when I think about neocolonialism. And the fact that it is happening now and many of the things that I present to people are things that people say we may have suspected, but we never even knew, we never heard some of the data, they may never even have heard it. And so I think that this is going on even at this, you know, in a, this our era of a high information era. And yet it's going almost unnoticed without any outrage, without any uh, you know, without any coverage whatsoever. Chinua Achebe said that until the lions have their own historians, the story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. Meaning that, uh, you know, a lot of what is going on, you know, some of it has not been recorded. And then those who are meant to record it, if we don't begin to record it now, in history, later on, down the line, uh, it, it may just be that our Western uh, donors will then be the ones who are glorified. And for some of the outrageous things that they've tried to force upon us, uh, the African countries may, may never really, may never really even be acknowledged, may never really even be exposed. So this is why I do what I do. Uh, and, and one of the most recent uh, and important relevant examples is what happened uh, in America in the last few months with the change of administration, uh, that uh, the there was a Mexico City policy which was in place from the previous administration and from other conservative administrations as well. So the Mexico, the Mexico City policy is uh, this policy within the United States uh, through the executive arm that ensures that the taxpayer, the American taxpayer is not funding abortion organizations in their international work. 
And it was back in with the new administration in January that the Mexico City policy was completely overturned. So money then started flowing into the hands of abortion organizations who come to African countries and who go to other parts of the developing world. So I just thought uh, about this Shinra Achebe's uh, powerful quote about the lions getting their own historians, keeping account of what is going on, taking records of what happens in the present time for the sake of history, just to make sure that history does not end up glorifying the hunter. Uh, and I, I made a video. I, I, you know, we decided to collect videos from various African countries, from different people in various walks of life about what people thought about just this latest uh, neo-colonial move um, that that is, you know, that has come from the United States. Uh, via its newest administration. And um, it's really, I think it really encapsulates just this thought of free, fighting for freedom. You would see exactly how the African people feel about, you know, what when the when our donor, when a Western donor comes in and they're so insistent and they are so particular about prioritizing something that is not that important or is not even important at all to the African uh, recipient. So I hope that this is a, a good enough note to end on. It's just to share with you this video. Uh, it's a 15 minute video, so bear with me. It's a, a, you know just uh, showing you exactly how the Africans feel. So thank you very much. Okay, well, um, oh God. Deborah, did you want me to just start in? Well, I'm, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, uh, can't some, I can't, you. yeah, I can't start my video because someone else stopped it. So oh. let me actually, um, let me just, do some introductions. I'm sorry for to everyone who can't see me, but I want to be sure that people uh, that people uh, know who they're talking to or listening to. Um, I'm not able to start my video, Michelle, because you turned you it off. It. You see me now? Yes. Okay. Okay. Very good. So. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so new at this. I hope you'll all forgive me. Anyway, I want to just introduce our speakers very briefly, and then I'll turn it over to the panelists. And I'm going to pre uh, introduce them in the order in which they will speak. Okay. So Professor Janet Smith is going to go first, as you probably already figured out. Um, and she is recently retired from the Sacred Heart Major Seminary in Detroit, Michigan. You, I'm sure everyone realizes who <laughs> knows her work uh, well, but she's the author of Humani Vitae, A Generation Later, and A Right to Privacy. Self-Gift is a volume of her already published essays on Humani Vitae and the thought of John Paul II. She edited Why Humani Vitae is Right, A Reader, uh, Life Issues, Medical Choices with Christopher Kazor, Living the Truth in Love, Pastoral Approaches to Same-Sex Attractions with Father Paul Cech, and finally, Why Humani Vitae is Still Right. Professor Smith served three terms as a consultant to the Pontifical Council on the Family, and also served as a member of the Anglican Roman Catholic International Commission for eight years. She has a regular column in the National Catholic Register, has received three honorary honorary doctorates, and several other awards for her scholarship and service. She has appeared on The Geraldo Show, Fox Morning News, CNN International, CNN Newsroom, Al Jazeera, and has done many shows for various series on EWTN. More than 2 million copies of her talk, Contraception, Why Not?, have been distributed. Our second speaker will be Mary Rice Hassan. She is a lawyer and she is the Kate O'Byrne Fellow at the Ethics and Public Policy Center in Washington, DC, where she directs the Catholic Women's Forum, a network of Catholic professional women and scholars. Mary is also co-founder of the Person and Identity Project, an initiative that equips parents and faith-based 
faith-based institutions with the resources they need to counter gender ideology and promote the truth about the human person. It's a very important project and everybody should take note of that and seek help there. An attorney and policy expert, Mary has been a keynote speaker for the Holy See during the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women, addressing education, women and work, caregiving and gender ideology. She also serves as a consultant to the US Conference of Catholic Bishops and Bishops Committee on Laity, Marriage, Family, Life and Youth and recently testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee against the Equality Act. Mary and her husband, Seamus Hassan, have seven grown children and one granddaughter. And then finally, our own local and well-known Teresa Stanton Colette is professor of the University of St. Thomas School of Law, where she serves as director of the school's pro-life center. Colette received her doctorate at the University of Oklahoma College of Law as a well-known advocate for the protection of human life and the family. Colette specializes in the subjects of marriage, religion, and bioethics in her research. Uh, Professor Colette has published numerous legal articles and is the co-author of a law casebook on professional responsibility and co-editor of a collection of essays exploring Catholic and Catholic perspectives on American law, that's small c Catholic, and then big c Catholic perspectives on American law. She is an elected member of the American Law Institute and has testified before committees of the US Senate and House of Representatives, as well as before legislative committees in several states. So I hope you'll listen carefully to our panelists. They're clearly very accomplished women. We're so honored to be able to welcome them here tonight to be with us. And with that, I'll turn it over to Professor Janet Smith. Okay. Uh, I would like to say, I just really thought that that video was incredible. Um, Uju's talk was fantastic. And uh, I think that she makes so many important points that our culture needs to hear. And she has a great, she's a wordsmith. I mean, she figures she has great phrases that capture uh, certain realities. And I think the, the phrase ideological um, superior, superiority is extremely important. Uh, I don't know how much racism there is in um, the attitude of the West towards Africa. But I think this idea of ideological superiority, and I, I'm going to talk even about maybe even a little insecurity uh, in the ideological superiority of the West. Um, the old colonialism, a lot of it involved uh, economic exploitation. They wanted the riches of, of Africa and, and power that came from those riches. But we have to ask ourselves, why are they so concerned to spread contraception and abortion um, in Africa? Why is that such a, a huge uh, item on the agenda of the West. Uh, some will talk about women's rights, um, and I, there's some of that for sure. Uh, some will talk about climate change, that too many people are, are threatening the world and African, there's too many Africans. Uh, I tend to think there's an enormous um, need in the West, what I want to call protecting Western uh, sexual perversity, that Westerns are out of control in our sexuality. We don't have any idea what the purpose of sexuality is anymore. And we're profoundly unhappy, uh, largely because of our, out of many reasons, <laughs> uh, but a big part of it is our failure to understand uh, the meaning and purpose of sexuality and our failure to value children. And that is a huge reality in Africa is still the enormous love for children and enormous love for life, joy, just sort of just just emanates um, from Africans. I, I had a, was blessed to have a trip there, and I was just blown away by that. Uh, just the, the just the old bubbling joy of uh, of Africans. Um, I was very interested when I first started working on the topic of contraception that the pill was called the anti baby pill, <laughs> the anti baby pill, which describes exactly what it is. It's against children. And I worked a couple years ago with a woman from Africa, a nun, 
who was talking about the reception of Humanae Vitae in Africa. And she said, there was no question it was, recept it it was received well. We love children. Uh, we saw no reason to limit the number of children. The big question was, as uh, Uju says over and over again, is that we want help with clean water supply and education for children um, and not uh, contraception and certainly not, certainly not abortion. Uh, I've given a talk, my talk, Contraception, Why Not, uh, tries to explain how contraception very naturally leads uh, to abortion. Uh, and then we, there's more I could, much more I could say about it leading to a lot of un, un, unhappiness. Um, I was on this committee year, years ago, uh, which was uh, bringing people together from all over the world. And one of them was a, an Anglican bishop. And he was, we were talking about the fact that Anglicans reject, I mean, Africans largely reject uh, homosexual relationships. And uh, he, he was trying to explain why that was the case. And he was basically saying, as uh, Uju says, this ideological superiority, that they were unenlightened, that Africans haven't been even fully Christianized. If we were fully Christianized, we would recognize the importance of recognizing homosexual unions. And so one thing I'm seeing is, again, a, a great condescension uh, towards Africans. And I want to say they're very healthy beliefs, healthy beliefs that manifestly bring joy, right? I, and anyone who goes to Africa will experience uh, that. Even the, the colorful dress, the music, the dance, uh, it's, just, it's just also extraordinary. They're not all walking around wearing gray and, and black and looking miserable, uh, which so many in our culture all our culture are. And my reply to this um, bishop was that it, maybe we had a lot to learn from Africans, that they're still closer to the way things are supposed to be. They haven't been um, completely poisoned by the um, Western uh, false views of, of the human person, uh, which I know that some of the other panelists will, will talk about. I remember years ago listening to an interview on NCR where a you know, a modern American woman was interviewing an African man about like how many sexual partners he's had in his life. And I thought, again, there, that's just a huge um, violation of cultural norms. And we talk so much about being respectful of other cultures. And as Uju pointed out, there's no respect going on in, in uh, our approach to, uh, to Africa. So I wanted to just point out a few things that um, Let's see, I hope I can do this. Um, I'm not finding everything I want here. One is that uh, people like Bill Gates and George Soros and others are just huge in um, trying to uh, uh, push population control uh, on the world, as she said. And it's, it's admitted all the time. And they think that it makes perfect sense that they do it. Um, can you see my PowerPoint now? I'm thinking maybe you can't. Okay, I'm going to, I can't hear anybody, but I'm going to do this. Janet, we can, we could see it. You could see it. All we right. We could see it. Yeah. All right. Good. That's good to know. And, and you have, I don't, I th just sure. keep an eye on the time, but yeah, yeah we I can hear four, you. Four minutes and two seconds. Okay. On my count here. If you have All right. Time. Very good. All right. Good. All right. So what I want to do is just so show, show a few slides here. If I could get this to disappear, I could. Uh, do my slideshow a little. All right. Um, I just want to show some of these slides because people are still so confused about whether or not the world is overpopulated and thinking we have to control Africa, especially. Um, this is a slide I showed years ago, and it shows from 1750 to 2150 about the world um, developing. And you notice that always stops at 2000. 150. <laughs> There's a reason, because at that time, everything starts going down. All right. Uh, this is another one that suggests total fertility. It's still the number of people having two to three children is this big pink or red one. And then you'll notice more and more people are having fewer children. Uh, it, well, the fewer children, I'm sorry, the other way around, fewer children is this big one. And that means there's going to be the whole fertility rate is going down worldwide. This is a slide that shows, um, sorry, again, declining fertility rate uh, worldwide, worldwide, and goes down from 1961 to 2019. And what you'll find in all of these slides is this burst of population up to around the year um, almost 2000. And then we see this change down, down, down. 
And for people to think that the world is vastly overpopulated is, it is absolutely ignorant. But the charts that are generally available don't show this. This is one of the few that does. This shows the, the decline in the fertility rate. It doesn't show the decline in population. Um, this is total fertility rate decline from 1950 to 2099. And they're stopping there because they don't wanna show us that it goes below replacement rate, which will be, which will be horrible for the um, economy. Here are two a little bit outdated. Um, they're not really outdated as far as content is current. I mean, they're not the current figures because it was like 2005 and I think 2009. But if you type in demographic winter in Google, you'll find astonishing things. Um, all right, I think that's, oh, that might be the last slide, though it's not the last. Yes, I wanted to show this slide. This is population growth 2000. And what this shows us is these are the, um, the countries in the world that are below population rate are all replacement, all, all these light blues. Everything that's light blue is the parts of the world that are below population rate, some of them very seriously so. There's only a few countries in the world that are above 2% to 3%, which is what you need to replace. And that's in Africa. Thank God for Africa. It's the only part of the world that's producing enough um, children to reproduce the people we have. There's even a smaller group of those who are still have a, um, a very healthy population growth to 3% to 4%. And a lot of this isn't having children. Again, it's people living longer, uh, babies not dying uh, at birth. So we're, we have a real problem in our world right now of um, a, po a, population, um, a population decline. And so I, I just wanna uh, thank Uju for giving us this talk. And I wanna say, we really have to dig deep and think that right now we have an enormous amount to learn from Africa, which is joy and which is the celebration of life and which is loving babies and loving large families uh, and not caring so much about whether or not you have a big, beautiful house in which nobody lives, all right? And if you have a big, huge car in which there's no one to drive around. Um, so I just wanna say that if we're going, if there's, if there's an ideological uh, superiority, <laughs> it's more likely that Africa has it than we do. And the colonialism needs to go the other way. Thank you. Okay, Mary. Wonderful. Janet, thank you for your remarks. And I agree, Uju's um, video was compelling. And, and your comments on the, um, the efforts towards population control, equally so. And so what I want to do with my brief 10 minutes is really to, to um, flesh out this idea of the master. So what, are, what is it that um, it, when Uju talks about Western donors and this neo-colonialism. I wanna put a few more facts out there just to help people realize that. One of the things that I do in my own work at the Ethics and Public Policy Center is I, I look at and track what people are doing in the international arena and how that affects marriage and family and particularly issues related to fertility, but also gender ideology. And the two are very much linked. They, where you see one pushing one agenda, you see them also pushing the other. So a couple of key points uh, to add here. Uh, Uju's focus, given her background and given her effectiveness and, and the work that she's done, has really focused on Africa. But this aspect of Western neocolonialism is not occurring just in Africa. We're seeing it also in Latin America, Central America, the Caribbean countries, to some degree in Asia, uh, and, and some of the Middle Eastern countries, but a lot of Catholic countries are really being targeted. And I, if you remember the map that Uju showed where uh, the abortion laws were more restrictive, it was not just Africa, it was also these other areas. But again, they're very much in the crosshairs of those who seek to change these global norms and uh, global practices regarding life and regarding the human person. So that's one. Uh, number two, just when Uju was talking about the Western donors and she mentioned the Gates Foundation, International Planned Parenthood Federation, Marie Stokes, IPAS, things like that. You know, that's, that's very much a part of um, who is funding the particular sexual and reproductive health and rights agenda. 
but it's actually bigger than that as well. And I, I think it's important to see the scope here. So it's it's not just those NGOs and those, those big donors. The uh, international banks, the funding mechanisms are all on board with this agenda as well. You have networks of philanthropists. So there's something called the Global Philanthropy Project, which has about 21 different uh, NGOs, foundations, uh, private actors that collaborate with different governments, and they they together coordinate just these tremendous sums of money that are given out to advance this agenda. And then you have the countries, again, Uju you mentioned some of them, uh, but I think it's instructive that a lot of the countries that are really pushing this are not just the UK, but Canada is a very big funder. You see Sweden and Finland very much funding this. And then of course, uh, the US. So how does this work? What does it look like when they're when they're funding something? It doesn't always mean that they're funding a program that specifically says reproductive rights or uh, something that's promoting contraception or promoting abortion, or even something that falls into that development bucket of population services and things like that. It's uh, They've gotten much more opportunistic, really, so one of the things that we see, and again, Uju mentioned that oftentimes donors will come in and they will say, well, here, we're going to solve a specific problem. You have a problem that there's not enough access to, to water. You need wells in your village. And then this, this uh, program, this funding opportunity expands. So for example, to use the, the specific need that a village might have, to, to have a well, a new well that's dug so people can have ready access to clean water. That's the specific aid. But then there are promotion funds because if you're gonna have a new well, you have to let people know it's there. You have to teach them how to use it because sometimes the mechanisms are different. You have to teach them how to maintain it, how to train it. So there's money for that. But then uh, part of the funding stream is you need outside experts. You need people who can come in and teach the local people how to do these things, who can coordinate the project, direct the project. But you also need a local face, someone who's going to be the, uh, the person who sells the local people on it. And oftentimes, especially regarding some of these projects that are really like uh, Trojan horses, they will simply find a local person and stand up an organization around that person. In other words, there was no grassroots organization that was saying, we need contraception, we need to change the gender norms. But what they'll do is they'll find one person who can be the face, who will say, we need clean water, but that requires much more. We need, we need something bigger. And so it, it moves from the specific aid to the promotion, to the people, to the policy and the law. Because using, again, the water as the example, one of the things that you will hear and you will see continually in the UN literature and the donor literature is the, uh, the framing of this as gender injustice, that it's usually women who are getting the water, women who are spending their time and women who are suffering because they don't have this. So it's not just providing the well that you need to do, you need to change the gender norms. And that means writing curricula for the school. It means training the village leaders. It means uh, uh, affecting the national policy and changing whatever laws might be erecting barriers to that gender equality. And then of course, gender equality requires that women have access to contraception and abortion. So there's this uh, this expansion. And as I said, there's, there's an opportunity in almost every area of funding. So what we see is that uh, there's the scope, the sweep of um, development work that ends up promoting sexual and reproductive health and rights, which is the euphemism that, that really means contraception and abortion. Um, the scope of, of the programs that takes in money for those purposes is extremely wide. And let me um, just give you a couple of examples. Uh, again, during COVID, uh, there was a lot of concern about emergency health needs. And in some countries, there have been civil wars and there are refugee crises. And so one of the things that the reproductive um, rights 
movement and that community has done, really the abortion providers have funded this and created these, what they call reproductive health kits that become essential services that must be given or, or funded to be available in refugee camps, in situations where there's some sort of humanitarian crisis. In the Caribbean, in South America, during the COVID crisis, there was an emphasis to make sure that the countries were purchasing these reproductive health kits well, what's in those is something called a manual vacuum aspirator, which is a, uh, a suction tool that can be used to perform abortions, even though it can also be used, and this is the way it's sort of pushed on these countries that are not abortion receptive, they push it as a way to treat um, miscarriages that do not complete but it's, it's really a, a Trojan horse. It's an opportunity to get these particular tools into the country under the guise of emergency services, train doctors in them. And then what it, what it means effectively is that you have expanded the number of physicians who are capable of doing office-based early abortions. So that's an example of, of how it comes in. Another area that is has really become a cover for promotion of contraception and abortion or any development programs aimed at adolescent girls. And the Biden administration, just in these few short months, has come out with a very strong statement reinforcing that their emphasis in terms of gender equality is going to focus on empowering adolescent girls. And they have a statement that's very revealing. There was a on International Women's Day, March 8th, uh, they said the USAID, which is our donor, um, the government's mechanism for foreign aid, uh, USAID's commitment to empowering young girls to take charge of their own destinies includes what we call the whole of girl approach. And then they go on to say, we, the United States, are the only donor country with a standalone strategy for empowering adolescent girls. Well, if, if you talk to someone like Uju or, or anyone from these African or, or South American or Latin American countries, they don't buy into the concept of standalone adolescent girls. They see girls as very much a part of their families, their communities, their religious traditions. So it's the US that is again, importing this ideological perspective that says, we see girls as autonomous actors who need to be trained in their reproductive and sexual rights and to be empowered and that begins with comprehensive sex ed and then providing all of these tools but also making sure that there are confidential health care services so that's another thing that we're seeing coming into not just africa but again these other parts of the world where the donors are are providing health care but insisting that parents be cut out that they treat adolescents again, 11, 12-year-old, 13-year-old girls, as if they are mature adults. But really, it's a way to, to form them and shape their attitudes. So uh, one last point here. What, what does this mean? Are we losing this battle? Is it, is it all uh, impossible, given the vast sums of money that are being expended here to promote this agenda? Well, I would say no. And uh, it's there is an interesting document that came out just a couple of weeks ago. It was published by the Global Philanthropy Project, and it, it bore the title of Manufacturing Moral Panic, Weaponizing Children to Undermine Gender Justice and Human Rights. And it is the lefts, in other words, these all these groups that are promoting this agenda, it's their document analyzing what people who are pro-life and pro-family are doing and identifying what is working. In other words, what are the weak points from their perspective? And, and they're, they're concerned because they see the effective messages, the things that are getting through to people on the ground, the things that, cr that create stumbling blocks and barriers in these local countries are when we can emphasize the fact that we care about children because that is something that resonates in these countries. And they, uh, the other side knows that Anyone who's got the message of concern for children, protecting children's innocence, protecting the family, strengthening the family, really is going to gain ground. And so that is a very strong point for our side, to speak the truth about children as the gift of life and the strength of the family. And second is the idea of what's natural. 
and perhaps for you can speculate why why that resonates more um, perhaps in Africa where where there are many more people who are living an agrarian lifestyle they're they're closer to the ground but there is a sense that some things are natural some things are the way they should be and what the West is imposing and encouraging does not resonate it it does not feel natural it does not um, they don't want to receive that because there's a built-in intuition that says this is not right. So when you label that as a violation against nature, it, it gains some ground. And then finally, to uh, emphasize the point that Uju did tonight, this neo-colonialism, because people who are in these other parts of the country, many of them remember those times of, of the economic colonialism, and they do not want this ideological colonialism and this um, ideological supremacy. They recognize it, they hear it. So the more we can emphasize that point and, and help people to go ahead and stand up and push back against these the master class, uh, these, these wealthy donors, um, the more effective we can be in helping people to really live according to the truth and according to their own uh, desires. So with that, I will turn it over here to Teresa Collette. Yes, and if I could say just one thing, Teresa, before you before you start, just a reminder to everyone, a verbal one, that if you want to ask a question, you can um, do that through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. So take it away, Teresa. Thank you so much. And it's such a privilege to be to participate in this panel. Uh, Janet and I have been well, and Mary and I have been friends for decades, dare I say. Uh, and of course, Deborah's contribution to the University of St. Thomas is just immense. And um, the program that she established with the Siena Symposium is tremendously important. So I'm delighted to participate. Um, this is a really important program and I would be remiss in not at least showing you, uh, those of you who want sort of more uh, by Uju, I suggest that you get her Target Africa book. It's a superb book. It's a short book, as you can see, um, but it is an important book that has been translated multiple times and basically sets forth sort of the concerns that she expanded upon today. The reality is, as both Janet and Mary indicated, is that sadly for decades, our country has embraced the idea that women's fertility is a problem. <clears throat> it is an impediment to women's equality. And therefore, uh, we need to promote both access to contraception and when contraception fails, access to abortion. We have also embraced uh, under the Nixon administration and it was subsequently carried forth by um, other presidents, the idea that the la that high fertility rates in developing countries necessarily pose a security risk to the United States. And therefore it is our national interest to um, ensure that those fertility, fertility rates decline. And as Janet noted, um, not exclusively as a product of American concern, um, but in part in response to American funding, USAID, various other initiatives, um, foreign countries at their leadership level, as Ujo, uh, Ujo indicates, have accepted this idea that reducing fertility is a necessary component of achieving sexual equality. Now, the very fact is, as Mary can also testify, the reality is the, the most effective um, policy that seems to reduce fertility rates to uh, in a healthy way is simply expanding economic opportunities for women to participate uh, in the general economy. So you have countries in Africa still where um, professions are closed to women, rights of inheritance are not denied to women. So there are some true injustices to women in that continent. But the answer is not to eliminate fertility. It is not to eliminate the children in the culture. 
It is rather to expand authentic opportunities for human flourishing of the women and men in those countries. And yet that does not seem to have been either American agenda, nor is it the agenda of the United Nations. I like to spend my very brief time in sharing uh, a PowerPoint that gets a little more specific on how this manifests it in the law. And so I'm gonna open up my PowerPoint um, and the PowerPoint is uh, directly um, addressed to um, the Mobuto uh, protocol. It, it is, um, so in international law, you have uh, various treaties that the United Nations has actively involved in promoting or even declarations like the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Um, and, and those are at an international level. States uh, join these international agreements. Um, but we also have, in addition to that, uh, regional protocols or regional treaties. So think about the United Nations, uh, think about the European Union and their regional agreements. Uh, the United States has regional agreements. We are um, parties to the Inter-American inter uh, the Human Rights uh, Treaty, as well as we participate in the Inter-American uh, Commission and Court of Human Rights. Well, this is the African version. This is the national or the regional version. And what's really interesting about this document, uh, there are many things that are interesting about the document, but it is specifically art articulating, as the title says, human and people's rights on the rights of women in Africa. And it was drafted uh, under the close supervision and scrutiny of various United Nations officials and other international, um, what are proclaimed to be experts in the area. And it is the only regional agreement. It is the only international agreement that I'm aware of that directly endorses abortion. And so that's problematic. Uh, it's problematic when we encounter it as lawyers, uh, when there are claims that African nations who want to adhere to their authentic understanding of human flourishing, adhere to the authentic understanding of what marriage is, uh, what, uh, how to respond to fertility, those sorts of things, when they encounter claims that they are violating these sort of regional treaties. And so as we note here, and this is by the um, African uh, Commission on Human Rights, that Article 14 guarantees women's right to health, including sexual and reproductive health. Now, Janet has already noted, as has Mary reinforced, that this is um, diplomat speak for contraception and abortion in, in many ways. Um, in Africa, there is a, a true uh, obstetrical crisis related to, for example, obstetric fistulas. Um, that's really not what they're trying to address here. They're trying to address that Africans are having too many babies. And so how do we solve that quote problem? And so they talk about women's right to sexual and reproductive health uh, and, and including the right to control their fertility. And, and look at this language because it comes out of the Beijing a court conference where uh, Professor, uh, then Ambassador Marianne Glendon, a Harvard law professor, a faithful Catholic, an amazing woman, ambassador to the Holy See at one point, uh, was representing uh, the Holy See in those negotiations and strongly rejected the language that was proposed that would have explicitly said that, that there is a right to contraception and abortion. And so instead, the euphemism of right to sexual and reproductive health and the, and the control of their fertility uh, would be um, rephrased in this way. And the right to decide the number of children and spacing of children. Now that was language that the Holy See acquiesced in because it, has it says nothing about artificial birth control. And in fact, Humana Vitae, and Janet can uh, confirm this, Humana Vitae recognizes that a couple have a legitimate interest in uh, 
deciding the number and spacing of their children based on various moral considerations, including the health of the woman, the, the uh, status of their family, et cetera. As well, now here's where they go get off the rails though, the right to choose any method of contraception that is not in uh, multilateral international agreements. This is unique. And the right to family planning education. And just as Mary noted, uh, part of the redirection um, of cultures is done through educational institutions. We're seeing it in the United States today. So as we look at this, then what we see is um, that uh, it is that the state parties, meaning the nations of Africa, are called upon to take, quote, all appropriate measures to protect the reproductive rights of women by authorizing medical abortion. That's the chemical abortion. And here's where they, they, they do, again, the diplomatic doublespeak, because it looks like a relatively uh, narrow authorization in cases of assault, sexual assault, rape, and incest, and where continued pregnancy endangers the mental and physical health of the woman or the mother or the fetus. Okay, so it's important to note that language is language that we are disputing here in the United States as well, but it would seem that it's particularly limited until you look at the definitions that they use for mental and physical health of the woman. And indeed, as they have changing definitions of rape. So um, you have the international controversy about um, uh, an American star, uh, American movie star who engaged in sex where the condom broke. And then one of the Scandinavian countries wanted to prosecute him for rape because while the woman consented to have sex with him, she didn't consent to have, quote, unprotected sex. And the uh, condom being defective meant that he had exceeded her consent. So this looks, what's what can look like a fairly narrow exception by these sort of lawyer games, and yes, I am a law professor, but there are lawyer games, by these sort of lawyer games suddenly become the exception that follows the rule. It tells us that, and this is by the African Commission on uh, Human and People's Rights, it's noted that the Mobutu pro Protocol in its very first uh, treaty <clears throat> to recognize abortion, which they are proclaiming proudly, under certain conditions as women's human rights, which they should enjoy without restriction or fear of being um, prosecuted. They note that it provides for women's rights to terminate their pregnancies contracted following sexual assault, rape, or incest, or, and here they begin to talk about what that means. Forcing a woman to keep a pregnancy resulting in these cases constitutes a, a, a additional trauma which affects both their physical and mental health as evidenced by the UN's um, definition are responsible for ensuring compliance with the treaties that advocate for women's access to therapeutic abortions, a phrase we find in some of the older American laws um, where the pregnancy is resulting from sexual assault. Again, as reading this, it looks like we're talking about forcible assault, uh, forcible rape. Uh, it means that we're not talking about um, the, the idea that a woman consented and they came to regret it at some point, or that the definition is so broad to encompass uh, voluntary sexual interaction where the circumstances of that interaction change because of a defective co condom or other sort of external circumstances. But they note here that when they're talking about health, they're not using the definition of health that we consider. They are talking about the World Health Organization's definition of health, which is the state of complete physical, mental, and social well being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Now, that's crucial because anything that the woman identifies as making her unhappy suddenly becomes a mental health exception. Okay. Anything that might lead to the woman's change in social circumstance because of the cost of an additional child suddenly becomes something that falls within the health exception. 
the reasons put forth by the woman seeking an abortion must be taken into account and the states are required to ensure that legal frameworks in place facilitate access to medical abortions where the pregnancy threat poses a threat to the mental or physical health of the pregnant mother. In other words, and we actually have an abortionist who has testified in the United States Congress that uh, it is true. If a woman comes to me and says that she is distressed by the pregnancy, that is sufficient to qualify under the mental health exception. That is not what most people think when they're reading what is supposed to be a very narrow exception. Say, hey, Teresa, yes, I'm sorry to bother you, interrupt, but um, my, the sound sounds kind of funny, but um, sorry, you, you're at about 12 minutes. Oh, I apologize. I only have yeah. one more slide, so I okay. will, I will okay. wrap it up, but forgive me. I couldn't see my time measure on the bottom of the slides. It's so okay. It's okay. All right. No problem. So measures facilitating access uh, must include accountability measures, development of implementation standards and guidelines, monitoring this. Notably, and, and so when we're talking about the mental health exception, again, a claim that the United States pro-life movement has been, you know, resisting for ever since W. Bolton in 1973, right? We've got the same problem here. They tell us that evidence of prior psychiatric examination is not necessary to establish a risk to, to mental health. So essentially what the Mobuto protocol does that has not been done in any other regional setting, including the Inter-American, um, agreement regarding human rights or the EU is to establish free access to abortion for women throughout the entire pregnancy. And with that, I will um, apologize for exceeding my time and welcome any questions that Deborah or members of the audience uh, have provided to Deborah. Thank you. Okay, so I know you can hear me but can't see me. Can you see me now? Uh, yeah. Um, okay. So, Michelle, you'll have to do that. Oh, I see. Okay. Sorry, everybody. You know how technology goes. Okay. So, uh, we do have a question, and I have a few to fill in while people are maybe thinking about theirs. One person has asked, what is the Catholic Church doing to combat these infiltrations? And I think it might be okay to hear from each of you on that, what you know about it what you can say about it. So perhaps, um, Janet, you could start and then we could move down the line. I'd love to have our prime presenter here uh, who could maybe speak to what African bishops uh, are doing about it. I think that would be mm -hmm. the right, one of the right ways to go. I, I And uh, Mary might know more than I about American bishops, but let me say the church is more than just the bishops and um, the women here. Are doing a great deal uh, about this, and uh, I think the laity have really stepped up um, to to combat some of these things. So I have to say I'm very proud of, that I know such people, and um, Uju is clearly an incredible gift from God uh, to have a such a beautiful, articulate, knowledgeable woman uh, exposing these realities is is such a gift. So I want to say. If we look at the church as a whole, uh, it's doing pretty well. The leadership might not be everything we'd like it to be. Mary? So, um, I'll let Teresa address the, the UN and, and the uh, what the Holy See does there. I think there were some really good efforts there. Um, what I can speak to is that I've seen in various parts of the country, it's the um, the pastors and the and the priests on the ground are very limited in many of these countries. I mean, there some of them are ministering far flung parishes with few resources. They're not going to be sort of leading a, a political pushback. They're they're trying to teach their people and feed their people. But there are organizations like Human Life International. There's good collaboration with some other organizations uh, that are, are not Catholic. Family Watch International pushes back on both a um, regional level as well as at the UN and, and things like that. So I think uh, to, to Janet's point, we have to see the church as much bigger than, than the, the clergy because the clergy have a specific role. But I think in those countries, uh, at least my my sense is that they're not the ones leading 
pushback, but I wish there were more focus in the US among the laity uh, to realize this this threat to our brothers and sisters in other parts of the world because it's real yeah. and, and they have so few resources. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. So uh, my, so my comments are, uh, having served on the Pontifical Council for the Family, one of the things, one of the many things I found surprising is that the Crisis Pregnancy Center, which actually is the largest sort of pro-life organizations in the country. I mean, that's where the majority of pro-life people give their time and their treasure and they work among uh, women in crisis. Uh, those sorts of organizations have not been well established in other countries. And so I know for a fact that there are in some African countries initiatives by various uh, Catholic groups, including things like the Knights of the Holy Sepulcher or some of these other organizations where that is an initiative that they are trying to pursue, the Knights of Columbus, et cetera, is really establishing crisis pregnancy centers, regardless of what the law is, to persuade the individual and to give support and care to them. Um, also, as Mary noted, um, the mission of the Holy See that represents the Holy See's interest in the United Nations um, work diligently. They are a small staff, but they are amazingly talented diplomats, and amazingly talented um, lawyers on that staff in, um, often that have attempted to uh, push back against this United Nations drive to um, create rights to abortion where none exist in the treaties. Um, let me give one quick example. When they were, the, the Holy See is a member to the Convention to Prevent Torture. Now that seems to me fairly uh, intuitive of what that means, but when they presented their report to a U.S or to a UN review committee. Uh, the UN review committee said they were in violation of their treaty obligations because they forced women to continue to endure pregnancy. Um, our teaching on abortion was a violation on the convention against torture. Uh, the UN uh, diplomats present after careful consideration gave a stirring defense of the church's position and also warned you know, if you continue to abuse uh, the treaty provisions in this sort of double speak, what you'll see is that people won't sign treaties and the world will be worse off. So we have very skilled diplomats there working. Yeah, I would add something from my perspective, if I might, and that is that it seems to me there is more than one level of attack here. There is a, the on the ground or several actually on the ground level in being with women in need and another level of organizing pro-life action uh, groups and so on that can prevent further encroachment. But at, at the higher level, really, the problem is the West thinks it knows all the answers. And this is, to me, this is, an, this is evidence of systematic racism. I mean, you know, the, I don't understand why people don't grasp that what's being demanded here is the killing of black babies over the protestations of their, the women in their, most of the women in their culture. It's quite shocking. So I think there's that political or sort of, um, yeah, political, if you will, uh, and uh, work that needs to be done to expose and illuminate what Uju calls a master, now now the master is ideological. It's an attempt to impose ideological uh, thinking on people. And Pope Francis speaks about this himself, so we could leverage that. A another question was, um, what can taxpayers do to push for a reallocation of our resources? Um, yeah a reallocation of our resources. And maybe this would be a good time for me to mention the video that um, Uju spoke about. Uh, we showed that at our luncheon event, but we didn't have time for that this evening. But I highly recommend that anybody interested in this uh, uh, watch that video. It's 15 minutes long. It's actually called A Message to Joe Biden. And you might need to connect it up with Uju's name or something like that to find it. You can get it on Google and, and uh, it will also be available along with the video of this event on the Murphy Institute website at a certain point. But 
the 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 video is so powerful because of the number of people that she has saying to the camera from all over the African continent, help us, don't kill us. And here are all the things we need help with. And uh, so th that, that reveals a kind of groundswell of real uh, concern there. It's so very obvious that this is an imposition by the West on the African continent. Wait, I got distracted there, didn't I? Gosh, I'm so sorry, you guys. I'm really tired. You have no idea what I've been through this week. OK, well, what about the taxpayers question? I, Teresa. Also, yeah, I okay. think Jerry I, I, covered I, it and touched on it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, elections have consequences. This was one of the things that was spoken about and that we could predict. And now, now we're seeing there is just such a reversal. In, in the last administration, I worked with different people who were at USAID, who worked at state, who were fantastic people. And yet it took them, you know, most of the four year time period to try to even find the, the problem areas that were left over from the Obama administration to work through the, the um, necessary procedures to change things. And they were doing good work, significant work, but a new administration comes in and they have hit the ground running. They know exactly what they want to do and it's pedal to the metal in terms of, of funding and removing the restrictions. So uh, elections have consequences. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess that was the connection I was trying to make is that uh, would you, the whole the whole thing, the whole video is a plea to Joe Biden to not sign that executive order that he eventually did. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, it's, they're very aware. She sent out a text when that when he signed it to the whole all of her contacts in Africa, and they were all so upset by it. They had been, the message was pleading with Biden to not do that for lots of reasons. Um, I can ask a question. I actually have I, a few. I respond to that. Uh, yes, to please. Talk. Thank yeah. you. Sorry. I, I fully agree with Mary. I mean, I, I've not been much of a political person in my life. And now I really realize that was a mistake. And uh, I need to pay a lot more attention um, to elections. And uh, I've always given some money, but really to get out there and do something. And it's very important. There's also, um, we, one question that is a point relevant to the last question as well. There's a website, um, an organization called Lepanto Institute, and they have a great page that lists all these international organizations um, who, that are donors uh, to third world countries and rates them for how faithful they are uh, to Catholic uh, teaching in respect to different issues. And so it's extremely helpful if you'd like to make donations to organizations that are faithful to Catholic teaching, you can find their rating and they have documentation. It's not, it's not just rumor or subjective preferences. It's very clear. They make their cases very well. Le, the Lepanto Institute, L-E-P-A-N-T-O, Lepanto. If there are lawyers or other professionals on the uh watching this video either now or after it's posted on the website. There are also opportunities, and Mary probably has much more experience than I do in this area, of posting comments on proposed regulations related to uh, USAID or other things. And those can be very effective. Uh, it's, a, it's a mechanism. And what your comment would be, there's a proposal, for example, to suspend parental uh, consent to certain vaccinations or to, to whatever it is that we know uh, are related to the use of, of fetal remains, then you could go on site and use your professional expertise. It doesn't have to be long. In fact, it's better if it's not very long, <laughs> but do a one or two page comment about, you know, this is, this is not good public policy and here's, here's my reasons why and here's the evidence. So people, people, people matter in this country. It's hard to believe sometimes, but it's absolutely true. So we can participate in lots of ways. Mm -hmm. I would second that just in terms of the um, involvement, because when you when you make those comments on pending regulations, whether it's domestic or, or things that relate to foreign policy or, or, or even UN things, things where um, the, recently the SOGI expert had requested input from different groups, when you make those comments, at least in the US, they've got to deal with them. They have to address them. They have to at least acknowledge 
that category of objection that you're making. So it, it has an impact. And as far as um, pushing back with senators and, and congressmen, you, you just got to make those calls and, and send those emails. It doesn't have to be something long that's going to take you an hour, but they, at the very least, their staffs are tallying them up. And you may have someone who's never going to change his mind, but it, it helps if he realizes there's enough people out there who really, of his constituents, who really, really don't like the direction he's taking on these things. So it, it does matter. It does matter. I had a U.S. Senator once tell me that for every email they get, they assume it represents at least eight other uh, constituents. So it matters far more than you think. Um, we have a, a time for maybe one more question and we have a good one. <laughs> well, they've all been good, but here's a rather uh, a targeted question. President Biden is Catholic. Melinda Gates, I believe, is Catholic. Would someone be willing to discuss how it seems the Catholic Church appears to be a divided house when it comes to these life issues? Janet, that's right in your yeah, ballpark. Janet, that's you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, I, I would say uh, my good friend Monica Migliorona Miller just wrote a great piece in the Catholic World Report about how the U.S. bishops should respond to Biden on this. And uh, the church has been divided for a long time, a very long time, and it's not getting any better. I thought it was for a period of time, and then it backslid here. So, um, we really, it means something to be a Catholic. And it's not just Biden and uh, Gates. My gosh, if you look at the number of Catholic legislatures who are on the wrong side of these issues, it's absolutely devastating. And I, I do think that bishops need to take a stand and they need to go talk to them individually and uh, try to bring them around on these issues. And if they don't, they have to ask them not to present themselves for, for communion because uh, we shouldn't. If we're, if we're not in line with church teaching on major matters, uh, we have no business going to communion. We're not in communion. In, going to communion is showing that you're in communion uh, mm -hmm. with the teachings of the church. And if they refuse not to present themselves, uh, they need to make a public statement to say that uh, you know they have talked with them and they've informed them. And now if they go forward, if priests and bishops choose not to give them communion, that is probably the right thing to do. And they, mm -hmm. no one wants to embarrass them like that. No one wants to make a political weapon out of the, out of the Eucharist, but it's not a weapon. It's, it's meant for those who are in communion in the, in the church. And there should be a process in which those who don't accept church teaching, especially in- oh, you, you went silent there. I'm, you're kidding. I've been muted the whole time. You no, you haven't not. just, no, the it just happened just one. I just yeah. said that way, that's very strange. Someone had it with me over there. Which one of you? No, it wasn't me. <laughs> it wasn't you. We'll talk about that later. <laughs> but we want to be. We probably want to wrap up pretty soon because it'll, it's almost nine o'clock. Did Mary? Did you want to add something? Uh, just picking up on Janet's point, I would say that you know the whole denial of communion. It's it's for the sake of that person's soul. It's to yeah. remind that person that they need to really get right with God and mm -hmm. and supporting uh, you know these public. Mm -hmm just the decisions that Joe Biden has made. Again, I can't judge his soul, but if I were his bishop, I would want to be talking very seriously to him about, you know, that's these are serious things and their their ramifications. So so that's that's an important thing. But second, we lay people are not off the hook. We need the leadership of the bishops, but we need to talk to our fellow Catholics. We need to inform them. We need to share the faith and share the facts. Mm -hmm. about things like everything that Uju, you know, Uju was talking about. Mm -hmm. How many people really know that? Mm -hmm. Well, I would like to bring this to a close, I, I think, because otherwise we'll lose our audience. <laughs> um, but I, by, by just mentioning to you all something that Uju said today when she was with us in person, I don't recall the exact question that was asked, but she said that the way to approach this is to realize, you have to step back and realize that until not that long ago, the, the, the norm that Africa represents in terms of its um, vision of life, the, the joy that is expressed there, the love they have for their children, all that, that was actually the way it was. 
and and uh, the, it was the way it was in the U.S. You know, it wasn't like it is now. And so she said, she said I was so touched by. She said, "What you need to do is remember that, and realize you are trying to recover something that you had, that someone else is now trying to take and has been successful in taking away from you. You have." So she said, "Here, Africa doesn't have a monopoly on virtue." You know, this is a part of human, the human experience. This is really a feature of being human, these kinds of emotional connections to others, et cetera, that are so on display in Africa. That is not just the African experience, she said, that is the human experience. It was wonderful. And so I think sometimes we, we're so on, we're on defense, but we're so concerned to prove our points that we forget to just I don't know, to ha have this attitude of simply not, I don't need to prove this to you. This is, I don't know how to put it. Being more confident that we are right. And that's what she said. You have to remember you're right and uh, not let those forces uh, really take, take over anywhere. We had it before and you guys have robbed us of it. So you're, you know, get get thee behind me satan you know although don't don't say that i don't think you should say that okay so just a couple of um a closing comments just to say thank you so much to our panelists what i wish we were all together we would give you a round a resounding round of of, of applause you were so impressive and the information that you provided was fantastic um and then also um we've recorded the program and we will let you know once the video is available and uh, hopefully with some of my more awkward moments edited out. I don't know. <laughs> and then um, a thank you to everyone that, that joined us tonight. Um, it's such a wonderful solution for our situation that we could at least do this this way. So I promise the next time we have a, a webinar, well, um, I'll be better prepared or something. I don't know. I did something like this myself on Monday night. It went just fine, but this was more complicated. Okay. Well, thank you and good night. <laughs> That's how I'm supposed to end it. Right. See you soon. Take care. <laughs>